Hello and welcome to our first online seminar in our course about the Welsh and Scottish elections 2016. Today we're going to be discussing uh, the questions that you've asked about the government uh, processes in Scotland and Wales and how the electoral system works. I'm very pleased to say that I'm joined by Professor Richard Wynne-Jones from Cardiff University and Professor Ailsa Henderson from Edinburgh University uh, to help me try and answer your questions. And I'm also joined by Judith Sistermans who will be, answer, uh, who will be monitoring our Twitter account and picking up any of your comments and questions on Twitter as the seminar progresses. So we begin today with a discussion about devolution in general and how it's evolved um, in different ways in Scotland and Wales. Um, and Phil Wielden has a question where he asks, so unlike in Scotland, which has a parliament, Wales has an assembly and a Welsh government. And he's wondering why the two countries have taken or been directed on different routes uh, to controlling their own affairs. So Richard, both countries have been on different journeys since 1999. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, but actually to understand why we've been on these different or though possibly increasingly converging journeys. You've got to go back way beyond 99 and indeed 97. There's a lot of path dependency in the history of devolution. So the Welsh proposals for devolution go back to the late 60s. The Scottish proposals are more recent origin. They come from about mid 1974, the particular plan that meant that Scotland was having more powers than Wales. That actually emerges around 1974. And then of course we have the referendums in uh, 1979 where devolution is overwhelmingly rejected in Wales, narrowly approved in Scotland by not by a big enough majority to clear the 40% hurdle. Then it re-emerges onto the agenda in the late 80s. And what happens there is Wales basically reverts to the proposals that were there from the late 60s onwards, essentially, whereas the, uh, the whole process in Scotland, the Constitutional Convention and so on, established this idea of a powerful legislative parliament. And that's what was approved in the referendum in Scotland in 97. What we got in Wales was approval for basically the 1979 stroke early 60s proposals. But interestingly, and I can bore for hours on the history of this, and I'll try not to, but interestingly, What's happened since devolution is that Wales has been very unstable. So we've had lots of changes in the devolution dispensation and we've become more similar to Scotland in terms of the model of devolution. And indeed now we're just in the process of moving to a so-called reserve powers model of devolution, which is very much based on the model that Scotland has had since the parliament opened here in 99. So there have been these separate trajectories and you've got to go way back into the history of the debate in the Labour Party in particular to work out why. But since devolution, there's been much more convergence, with Wales becoming more similar to Scotland. Okay, and related to that, Richard, Julie M. Cobran's got a question about, she says, it appears to me the Westminster government has overall power as they ultimately have control over the budget for the Welsh Assembly. The Welsh Assembly has to work within these confines, so do they really have much power? Well, both Scotland and Wales are currently funded in the same way. Uh, they're currently basically funded by the Barnett formula, which leads to a transfer of money from the Treasury in Whitehall to the uh, Scottish and Welsh governments. That is about to change. Obviously, tax devolution is coming. But what's interesting about this transfer and what makes the, the UK situation rather different from the one that you find in most federal states and in most regionalised states is actually that money comes with very few strings attached. Okay, so certainly in Wales we mourn about the Barnett formula and it's unfair to us as compared to Scotland, uh, we would say. Um, but what's interesting about that is that the money comes and the, there's no requirement to spend that money in a particular way. So the Scottish and Welsh governments have a lot of freedom, or indeed the Assembly in Wales and the Scottish Parliament, uh, they ultimately determine the, the budget, but in a sense, the devolved level has a lot of freedom in terms of the allocation of that money once it arrives. So, I mean, yes, it's a check that arrives from London, but once it's arrived, there's a great deal of freedom in terms of how that money is spent. Um, and just finally on this area, Richard, um, Andrew Manning has a question um, about whether um, will voters in Wales desire um, greater autonomy for the Welsh Assembly. So he says it always appears that um, Cymru, particularly in the old industrial south, um, it's not really in demand. Um, how, how has that situation changed since devolution? Well, 
if you recall the 97 referendum, the map of Wales in terms of the yes and no vote, and recall that was a very, very, very close result. I think the overall majority in favour of devolution was 0.3% of the Welsh electorate. I think the majority was 4,721. So it couldn't have been closer. And if you looked at a map of Wales, what you had was basically a west-east split that the kind of traditionally Welsh-speaking areas and the industrial areas voting in favour of devolution and the more anglicised east and indeed Cardiff, the capital city, and that kind of remote southwest corner, Pembrokeshire, Little England beyond Wales, voting against. And what we've seen since then, and this was seen very vividly in the 2011 referendum, we had a referendum in Wales on further powers in 2011, and what we see, saw there was a much more even picture. So support for devolution has increased in those areas where it was lowest uh, in 97. So Wales has become actually more unified. And in terms of the, in, the old industrial valleys, well, there's, those areas actually supported devolution uh, back in 97. It's the more urban areas on the South Wales coast and along the border with England. Those are the areas which have become more favourable to devolution than they were in the early years. Mm. So we could see they started out in different places but have gradually converged. There's been a lot of conversions and you know what was very striking about the 2011 referendum is that the you know you're not comparing like with like in terms of the 97 referendum and the 2011 referendum but if we if we assume that a yes vote in both referendums was support for devolution the biggest swing in favour from 97 to 2011 was actually in the northeast corner of Wales. So, you know, in the suburbs of Chester in, in some way. So, yeah, so Wales has become much more unified in terms of a general support for devolution and indeed more devolution. Mm. And moving on also to talk about the electoral system, um, Sandy Johnson has got some quite specific questions about the electoral system. Um, so starting off with the, the fact that the voting system would seem to be quite helpful to independent candidates who might have a strong following in a constituency. Um, but the impression is that this has been less likely to occur in most rec more re recent elections. Um, do you think that's the case? I mean, it's actually been quite rare when we've had independents uh, present in the, in the, in the parliament. Uh, independents can come from two different places. One is that people can run as independent candidates and, and win seats in, in the parliament, or they can be in parties and leave their parties and become independents. And by far the largest source of independence in the Scottish Parliament has been that second source. Um, we've only really had six instances of, of people running as independents and winning, and winning seats. And of those six instances, it's actually just three, three individuals, and it's evenly split between constituency and list winners. So Dennis Canavan, stood in, in Falkirk as an independent, Falkirk West, um, former Labour member uh, uh, in a constituency, Margaret MacDonald off the Lothian's list, and, and one other person in the 2003 uh, election, Jean Turner. So it's actually quite rare that we find independents uh, winning elections as independent candidates. Okay, um, there's also a question about whether someone in the list, uh, on a list seat can swap parties in the course of a parliament, um, or do they have to resign their seat? I mean, the short answer is no, they don't have to resign. I guess there are, there are three things that might happen if you're no longer in the party that you, that you were in when you were standing as a candidate. One is that you can quit the party and join another party. One is you can quit the party and, stand, and become an independent. And the other is that you can be expelled from the party. Um, we have no instances of people going immediately from one party to another since 1999. Well, well, we've got a great one of those, Elsa. We had somebody going, Mohammed Ashgar, going from the Conservative Supply Committee, which was one of the more unlikely uh, crossings of the Rubicons that we've had in Welsh politics. So we have an example of exactly See, that. Well, we've, we've, got, we've got none of those, and, and we've, got, uh, we've got four instances of people being expelled, but we've got eight instances where people have been party members and then gone on to, to become independents. Of those who have done so, if they try and seek election the next time round as an independent, all but Margot MacDonald have been unsuccessful. Right. So it's not a route to electoral success to, to do that. What we have now, however, is three candidates who left the SNP over the party's policy on NATO. They became independents. Two of them have subsequently joined other parties. They are now standing as candidates in regional lists for other parties, for Rise and the Greens. And so it remains to be seen whether they will then come off those lists as candidates for other parties. But that would be the first instance mm. that we would have. OK, and next we have a question about um, voting age. So is there any um, data on the possible impact of the reduction in the voting age in Scotland? 
Well, we don't know what it will be. We don't know what the impact will be for the 2016 election, but we do have a, a fair bit of information on on what happened in the referendum when 16 and 17 year olds could vote. And and one positive piece of information that's come out of the referendum is just how engaged those 16 and 17 year olds were. We were we were doing polling before and after the referendum and asking people about their sources of information. And for most electors, we found a, a considerable degree of confirmation bias. You know, if you're if you're leaning towards the yes, you you um, you would look to the Scottish government. You would look to the yes campaign for your information, and vice versa. If you were leaning towards the no, and the exception to that really was was the younger people in the electorate who were looking everywhere. They were looking at the yes and no campaigns, the Scottish government, the UK government. They were talking to friends and family, online sources, broadcast media. And in a way, 16 and 17 year olds were the ideal deliberative citizens in, in, the, in the Scottish referendum. And so certainly if, if there are concerns about their ability to discharge their civic duties, I think those concerns have been put to rest by what we've been finding around the referendum. So we have every reason to believe that moving into the election, this will continue. And Richard, what about plans in Wales to reduce the voting age? Are they well, not? at the moment it's 18. Um, there is a new Welsh devolution dispensation. I never call them a settlement because they never seem to last very long, but there's a new dispensation on its way and that will transfer, if it's passed, that will transfer the powers to the National Assembly to determine things like its own boundaries, its own election system and indeed the voting age. And so I think we will see almost certainly before the next devolved election mm. uh, the reduction of the voting age to 16, but not this time round. OK, before we continue to discuss the electoral system, we're just going to go over to Judith to see if there's been any comments or questions on Twitter so far. Um, no comments or questions on Twitter so far, but maybe our 16 and 17 year olds uh, need to get on social media and get involved. Yep, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So do remember you can uh, tweet us live if you have any reactions or comments or further questions that have been provoked in your mind um, from the discussion. Um, but continuing to talk about the electoral system, um, uh, Murdoch McLeod has a question about uh, UKIP where he suggests that polls suggest that through AMS UKIP might for example gain seven seats in Scotland next month with the Labour vote seemingly continuing in collapse um, and also asking about John Curtis's suggestion that to improve Scotland's democracy people who no longer vote, want to vote Labour should split their votes between RISE and UKIP. Uh, maybe we'll deal with that second point first and then talk about UKIP. Yes, I mean, I, I think partly the answer to that um, requires an understanding of the way the electoral system works and obviously what happens with the allocation of regional list seats is in part based on what happened in the constituency contests. So the claim that, that um, Professor Curtis is making is that the SNP are going to win so many of those constituency seats that when we're allocating the, the list ones, they'll be kind of at the bottom of the queue, at the back of the queue, in order to get some of those regional list seats. And therefore, if you're a voter who supports independence, don't vote for the SNP in your regional list um, vote. Vote for another party that supports, um, supports independence. Now, there's a, there's a couple of things going on with that. And, and one thing about strategic voting, whether it happens in first past the post, or in the constituency contests of this election, or in the regional list, is that it requires accurate information about what is likely to happen. It requires accurate information about who's likely to win those constituency seats. It requires accurate information about who is the credible alternative to the party that you want to defeat if you're engaging in tactical voting for other reasons. And often what we're lacking is that level of, of accurate information that is at the level of the constituency or at the level of, of the region. So it's a risky game because in order for you to follow that, possible strategy, it assumes that you know exactly what's going to happen in all of those constituency contests. And I'm not so certain, particularly given what's happening with, with polls and the perceived accuracy of polls, I'm not so certain that we have that information that would allow us to make those kinds of claims accurately. Okay. I think there's an interesting uh, Welsh dimension to this. We have, a, we have an, an AMS system in both Scotland and in Wales, uh, but ours is less proportionate, so we have fewer uh, list seats than in Scotland and that means that it's a it's actually a very favorable system to the largest party Labour who do well in the constituency so it's actually a very favorable system to them but the the downside of this for Labour voters is there are three uh, electoral regions in Wales there are five in total but there are three electoral regions in Wales where it's almost unthinkable that Labour will ever get a regional list seat unless they have a cataclysmically uh, bad evening and in those seats, using your regional list 
uh, vote for Labour if you're a Labour supporter is effectively a wasted vote. And what they, makes that particularly interesting this time round, of course, is the rise of UKIP. We'll come back to UKIP in Scotland yep. in a moment. But UKIP is clearly now a factor in Welsh politics. We are all expecting UKIP to have at least five and you know, possibly more seats in the National Assembly after May the 5th. And you know, in those, elect those three elect electoral regions, Labour voters who want to stop UKIP have a real dilemma. Do you vote for Labour, because presumably it's the party you want to vote for, knowing that there is no possibility of a Labour member being uh, elected from the lists, or, or do you vote for another party? And mm. then the issue then arises of what is the other party? And in fact, I mean, are you that hostile to UKIP? Because UKIP is clearly picking up some former Labour voters in Wales. So there's a real mm. dilemma. The election system, the electoral systems are never neutral. Mm. Mm. They, they, kind of, they, they kind of condition behaviour. But I think in the Welsh context and in the devolved context, I'm not sure that people yet have quite understood you know, what the implications of you know, two votes Labour, for example, in South Central mm. Wales as a, as a to, to choose one electoral region. Mm. And, and sticking on the UKIP issue, Richard, yeah. do we know anything about who, who's voting UKIP in, in Wales? The rise of UKIP in Wales is really an interesting phenomenon, and it's a very recent phenomenon. Mm. UKIP used to, you know, used to count Wales as well as Scotland as one of its weaker regions, to use that kind of language. Uh, that has now changed dramatically, and UKIP is now doing rather well in Wales, consistently around 15% in the opinion polls. Now, you know, with all the caveats around opinion polls, this is a pretty consistent pattern and almost pipped Labour as the largest party in Wales in the last European election. So they're doing well. Um, they, they seem to be doing well. I mean, their, their, their support was pretty even all over Wales. Um, I think that there's clearly some of that kind of disaffected older Labour supporters. There's a really interesting literature about UKIP mm. in England which focuses on kind of disaffected male voters. That's clearly part, working class, that's clearly a big part of the support. They may be gleaning support from uh, English incomers to Wales. A pretty large proportion of the Welsh electorate view themselves as English only, according to the last census, around 13%. Of Welsh, uh, of Welsh population view themselves as English only, given what we know about UKIP support in England being associated with a strong sense of English identity, that may also be playing a role. But because this is a very recent rise, since about 2014, our data is pretty limited in terms of the academic data available. Mm. Ilse, UKIP in Scotland, do we know anything about them? Yeah, we're, we're in a very similar situation. I mean, when we, when we do polls and we, we ask people what party they, they are planning to vote for, or what party they feel um, closer to, you know, you need a certain size of them before you can say definitively, well, this is what Green supporters are like, this is what UKIP supporters are like. And so sometimes we go through different routes to understand party supporters. So we have colleagues that are, for example, doing surveys of people who are members of particular parties to understand what they're like. Going at it from the root of public opinion surveys, we're, we're in a, a, a problem of samples where you have to actually start merging them across samples in order to get a sufficient size to figure out what's, what's going on. I mean, one thing we do know, however, is that even though we know that Scots are more supportive of, of Europe, which is one indication of who might be a potential UKIP supporter, even though we know that Scots are, are more supportive of Europe, more likely to vote to remain than are other parts of the UK, you know, Richard and I have been doing polling on, on this and with other projects. And, and if you ask people about their views of the European Union, if you ask them about how happy they are about red tape or immigration or other kind of indicators of Euroscepticism, Scots are not overwhelmingly less um, uh, Eurosceptic than are other parts of, of the UK. So on the one hand, they're making a different decision about what they think should happen with, with EU membership. Um, but in terms of their actual on-the-ground attitudes towards Europe, they are quite similar across different parts of the, of the UK. So in a way, that constrains UKIP in Scotland less than one might think, given what we know of the way that Scots are likely to vote in the Brexit referendum in June. Okay.
Um, moving on, we have a question um, about boundaries, and I can tell you Professor Henderson was delighted to receive um, this question from G.R. Gordon, um, who asks, um, is the population of each constituency and list region roughly equivalent to that of all the others, and how are district lines adjusted um, to ensure equal representation? Yes. This is actually a really exciting question, <laughs> not just because I'm interested in boundaries, but um, the, the, the Boundary Commission for Scotland sets the boundaries, the parliamentary constituency boundaries for, um, for Westminster elections and also for Holyrood elections, sets the boundaries of the constituencies and the regions. But uh, in the Smith Commission and in, and in the resulting legislation, the responsibility for, for drawing those boundaries passes from the Boundary Commission for Scotland to the local government Boundary Commission in Scotland, because that's the one that's already dealing with elections that occur within Scottish borders. So there's a change in responsibility there. The reviews take place every eight to 12 years. The first one began in 2007, and they reported in 2010. And yes, absolutely, they are supposed to design constituencies and regions that are as, as broadly as may be similar. So constituencies are supposed to be around 54,000 electors. Um, but they vary. Obviously, we have Shetland and Orkney and Western Isles. Those numbers are significantly lower than the others. The rest range usually from between 50,000 six, uh, 50, to 60,000. When we're talking about the regions, we get larger variation, and it goes from about 360,000 in the Highlands and Islands to 540, 540,000 in Northeast. So we get, we get larger variation when it comes to the regions, not surprisingly, because we're aggregating across multiple constituencies. But yes, absolutely, a goal is to make them as nearly as may be similar, this notion of electoral parity, that everyone's vote is worth the same. Hmm. Given that I'm putting my geek canarac on, I think there's a really interesting contrast, again, between the electoral systems in Scotland and Wales. At the moment, we still use Westminster boundaries for the constituency section of the National Assembly voting system. And that means that you've got a very, very large variation in size, very uneven in terms of size. But of course, we are about to see almost certainly a reduction in the number of uh, MPs in the House of Commons, and that affects Wales more than any other part of the UK. And if we see, um, that if the changes go through, and it's going to take another couple of years to confirm that, but I think it's highly likely, the number of Welsh constituencies uh, for Westminster will reduce from the current 40 to 29, and they will be more evenly sized, well, very evenly sized, that's the aim. So that raises really interesting questions, not for this devolved election, mm. but for the next one. So will they continue with, with a 60 seat assembly and then not have the same boundaries for Westminster as they do for the constituencies of the National Assembly, which creates all kinds of problems for the political parties, or do they increase the size of the National Assembly, which many people advocate? We've only got 42 backbenchers, effectively, trying to hold the Welsh Government to account. And so there are all kinds of issues about the future of the system. So, I mean, you know, at the moment, there's a really interesting contrast in terms of mm. the, the, the contiguity, if that's a word, between the Westminster uh, boundaries and the devolved boundaries and Scotland is different from Wales in that respect. Mm. I, I, that's a, an excellent point. I mean, I, in, in 1999, the, the Scottish Parliament constituencies almost mapped perfectly onto the Westminster constituencies in Scotland. The, the, the only difference was splitting Shetland, Shetland and Orkney. But with the reduction in seats to 59 in Scotland, Westminster seats to 59 in Scotland, and the start of the new review, which is likely to lead to 53 seats in Scotland, 53 Westminster seats, we're going to see further um, deviation between the boundaries of Westminster constituencies and the boundaries for, for Hollywood. But in addition to transferring responsibility for setting the boundaries to a different boundary commission, the legislation also allows the Scottish Parliament to make changes to the number of, of, of MSPs. So it could well decide, you know what, we don't want 129 anymore, we want, we want 73 or we want 212. And, and so there's, there's change, change coming both with respect to the Westminster boundaries, but also the Hollywood ones as well. Mm. Okay, on that note, we go to Judith to see if there's been any action on Twitter. Yeah, I've got some questions. Um, Excellent. And some boundary questions for you guys, I think. Excellent. Um, <laughs> well, there's a question asking from Daniel in Plymouth, asking, um, does the difference in the number of list seats between Scotland and Wales account for the presence of Greens in Scotland? Mm. And then we've got another question which kind of ties into the many levels of government we've got going on. Um, Charlie in Edinburgh asks, 
Um, why can MEPs only hold one post, but MSPs can also be MPs? Why are the dual mandate rules different? Okay, should we start with um, the Greens and the list in Scotland and Wales? Yeah, very simply, the Welsh system is less proportionate, and therefore the, you know, the, the implied hurdle that you have to jump over to get into the Assembly is higher. And so that is certainly part of the story. There are, there are also kind of contextual issues mm. with, the, with the Green Party in Wales and indeed other parties in Wales. But the, the barrier is higher in Wales for entry because of the electoral system. I mean, this is a, it's a semi-proportional system in Wales. And, and actually, I would, I would really stress the semi bit of the semi-proportional. Right. It's a, actually a very sticky system. Um, moving away from the Greens to the largest party, Labour, I mean, the stickiness of the system uh, is, is brought to mind when you recall that in 99, Wales got, uh, Labour got 26 seats in the Assembly, and that was a calamitous evening. That was a disaster for them. They got 30 in 2011, and that was triumph. You know, <laughs> between 26 and 30, is you know there's, mm. a, there's an enormous difference in terms of the percentage of the vote and so on and so forth, but a very small difference in terms of the number of as I see. This is a semi-proportional system, which is very favourable to the largest party, but pretty favourable to the other kind of established parties too. Very difficult for independents, for example, mm. to get at all. And that's one of the things which is remarkable about the rise of UKIP. If UKIP do enter the assembly as a substantial group. And that is a, you know, that's a genuinely impressive electoral feat. Whatever one's views of that party, you have to say that's an mm. incredibly impressive feat. Mm. And this proportionality is to do with the number of regional seats. So the system is the same, uh, but the, the, yeah. the difference occurs in this. The, there are two elements to this. First, the first past the post in Wales, in the Welsh electoral context, where you have one party being dominant mm. since 1918. I, mean, I think Labour has won. 36 out of 37 electoral contests in Wales since 1918. You know, it's an, you know, remarkable period of sustained mm. one-party dominance. First past the post really is very favourable to Labour. And then we have a smaller proportion of list seats to try and balance that out as well. So, in a sense, this is, this is favourable to the dominant party on both sides of the ledger, if you like. Mm. Ilsa, what about the Greens in Scotland? Have they benefited from the system? No, absolutely, and it's, that's exactly the, 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 the reason. It, the, the regional seats are a larger proportion of the legislature in Scotland than they are in Wales, and because of that, it is a more proportional system. Okay. And so therefore, it rewards, part, it rewards smaller parties campaigning purely on regional seats in a way that it can't in Wales. Okay, and this um, dual mandate question of the MEPs and MSPs and MPs. It's yeah, a good question. Um, it's, a good, it's a good question, and, I, and I, there's a difference between the rules and conventions. And, and so we know that in the first intake in 1999, there were 12 or 13 dual mandate um, MSPs who were simultaneously sitting in Westminster. And uh, you know, they, they held that right up until the next uh, Westminster election. Since then, it hasn't been barred so much as just frowned upon. So we now have a situation where I can't remember what year it was, but two candidates um, resigned their seats in the Scottish Parliament to contest an available seat that was opening up in Westminster. And that's not because the rules required them to do so, but it was just convention has changed. We do have, um, we do have dual mandate overlaps from time to time in the Scottish Parliament, but it's just, uh, it's just something that is frowned upon rather than, rather than prevented. I imagine in the case of MEPs, it's just rules governing different institutions. Mm, yeah. I mean, there's been, I mean, there's the politics of the toing and froing between the institutions is quite interesting. So we have the current Secretary of State for Wales in the UK government is a former Assembly member who resigned his seat and then, uh, well, he became an MP and then, and then left the Assembly. And we're seeing on the same day as, the, I think it's on the same day as the devolved election, a by-election in Ogmo, where we're seeing the current standing Labour MP, Huaranka Davis, giving up his seat in Westminster, and he hopes, and I suspect he will, get elected to the National Assembly. So there is kind of an interesting mm. toing uh, and froing which has, uh, uh, has continued. And we have, indeed, an MEP uh, is, is leading uh, UKIP's charge in the Assembly election. Mm. It'll be very interesting to see what he then subsequently does. Mm. 
And linked to this, there is also some controversy over the idea of not dual mandate, but dual candidacy. So yeah. candidates standing both on the list and on the, in the constituency. And I believe this was banned in Wales for a while. This was banned in Wales. Um, I have quite strong feelings about this, and I right. need to control my uh, you know, <laughs> turn, turn up the objectivity <laughs> dial. Yes, it was claimed that it was an outrage, it was a democratic outrage, that people could um, be, and I use the language, be rejected by the electorate in the constituencies, and yet be smuggled in through the back door of the list. And so, yeah, the 2006 Government of Wales Act banned dual candidacy. And that was kind of, you know, again, I'm being diplomatic. I mean, it's interesting to recall that in the first devolved election, Rhodri Morgan, for example, who went on to become Labour First Minister, actually stood in a constituency and on the list. So it wasn't frowned upon in the mm. early years of devolution, but it did become a, a political issue. Uh, when Labour didn't have any list seats, interestingly enough. But anyway, um, that, that, was, uh, that happened. It was subject to much criticism from academics and, uh, and others. Um, that has now been reversed. So we are a very interesting example in the current uh, campaign. We're seeing Leanne Wood, uh, the leader of Plaid Cymru, standing in the Honda, which is currently held by the Labour Party, but also topping her party list in the relevant electoral region. So we are now seeing at least some examples of dual candidacy. Um, it's still the subject of some controversy. There are some voices in the Labour Party who are unhappy about this. And it sounds part of the problem, of course, is that you have one party, Labour, dominating in the constituencies with very, very few or sometimes no list members and then other parties very heavily dependent on the list. Mm. So, for example, the Liberal Democrats at the moment. And that does lead to kind of tensions between, in terms of uh, legitimacy, I guess, you know, who's got genuine legitimacy uh, in the Assembly. And so that is one of the, uh, the, the other downsides of this particular electoral system in the way it's operated in Wales. Mm. But dual candidacy has never been banned in Scotland, Dale says that, right? Well, we see, I mean, the, the, the obvious example would be... Um, uh, no, 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 not so much. I mean, what we, what we find is leaders of parties no. are often the ones that, that run in the constituency but also are, make sure that they're at the top of the list so that one way or the other they're, we, can expect them to be, uh, we can expect them to be in the Parliament. Mm -hmm. Yep, so um, moving on from those set of questions, um, we move on to s some more um, fiscal questions about um, the, the Barnet formula and how um, public spending is, is, is um, worked out in Scotland and Wales. And Margaret, question, uh, Margaret Graham has a question about um, could Scotland raise its own tax, but if the Barnet formula is reduced, it in effect means people paying twice? And we touched on this a bit earlier, Richard. So what, what, how does that work? Yeah, I think, I think parts of the course will have a focus yeah. on, on these issues, and so I won't go into... Uh, uh, very much detail, not least because other people are more expert than I will be participating. But um, in terms of how this works, the whole idea of tax devolution, and you can, you know, you can agree with this or disagree with it, but the whole idea is that um, devolu uh, the tax devolution will make for more responsible, accountable government. The idea is that it's not healthy for a devolved government, for example, the Welsh government to be spending £15 billion a year but not raising a penny of that in terms of not having to make the political decisions which raise that money. So the idea is that if the Welsh government or the Scottish government is responsible for raising some of the money that it spends, it will behave in a, in a more accountable, responsible way. And therefore we're, we're seeing a move to tax devolution. Now, in terms of Doing that, what they're doing is, is allowing the devolved level in terms of income tax. We will eventually move to kind of partial income tax devolution in Wales. You're having much more substantial income tax devolution in Scotland. And the idea is that they will, in a sense, reduce the block grants and allow the tax, the devolved tax, to fill that gap. And, you know, and that, in a sense, it's a, I mean, I can see the logic. The problem is the practice, mm. okay? Because what you need to do is ensure that the devolved level uh, gets punished if it does stupid things, uh, or gets, but gets rewarded if it does things which grow the tax base and so on and so forth. Which sounds simple in theory, but is devilishly difficult in practice. And the big issue is how you adjust the block grants to mm. take into account for devolution. And that, is a, that was the subject of the negotiations on the fiscal framework between the Scottish Government and the Treasury uh, over the last few months. 
that is now the subject of negotiation between the Welsh Government uh, and the Treasury. And there's, this is hugely important. We, our centre in Cardiff published a report on this recently showing that the, the different methods that you might use to adjust the, the block can have difference to, you know, to the extent of hundreds of millions of pounds in terms of the size of the Welsh budget. So yeah. this really matters and it's actually, it sounds simple mm. uh, and I think, you know, I think it's got a, the, the logic is, is persuasive in many ways but in practice is actually a very difficult thing to do. Mm. And this is a really interesting issue, and as Richard says, we'll be discussing it um, in more detail uh, next week in particular when we discuss um, policies. So let's go back to Judith to see if there's any final questions from Twitter. We have a question from Megan Sterling. Okay. Um, she's interested in how, um, relating to our conversation about young people, how young people accessed information during the independence referendum mm -hmm. um, and how they might do so in these elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, we, it's a great question. I'll just jump right in. Of course. Um, uh, a, a great question. Um, yeah, we, we asked about sources of information, and they were the only ones that were consistently getting uh, what they described as a lot of information from a number of different sources on both sides of the political divide. And we, we didn't ask about this specifically, but our hunch is that, it, in part, a lot of these 16 and 17-year-olds are still in secondary school, and the schools were structuring discussions about how you engage as citizens with a, with, with a big decision like this and so they were um, not controlling but they they were providing them within an environment in which it, they, they were educated about well this is where you look for information these are the possible sources of information that you have and and I think for for many people this has been another argument for why there should be a permanent reduction in the franchise to, to 16 across all democratic events hmm. uh, in Scotland because that's a that's that's a way to use the electoral system to to um, help educate people about their role as citizens, not in an abstract sense. It's very hard to do if you're telling 15, 16, 17 year olds how to behave as citizens, but they know they can't vote until after they've left school. Whereas, versus a situation where you're, you're educating them about it in an environment in which they are expected to cast a ballot next month. Hmm. And I, I think that's um, it's a very different situation. Hmm. Judith, if we have no final questions for Twitter, I'll maybe ask a question that I, I spotted on um, one of the, the, the comments underneath one of our videos, which was the idea about there being a difference between list MSPs and constituency MSPs. Are they the exact the same? Do they have the exact same jobs, the same rights, the same roles? We, there's, that's an interesting question because I think in the early days there was a perception that the job you really wanted was the constituency MSP. Right and that you were somehow a lesser MSP if you were a, a regional uh, MSP. And, and I think that was entirely perception, but what we did find were instances where we thought regional MSPs were, yes, they were covering, they were representing the entire region, but they were camping out more often than not in particular constituencies and seeing that uh, regional position as a way to kind of get themselves into a constituency next time. So we did see behavior among the MSPs that seems to suggest that there was a hierarchy. Formally there is none. They, 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 they represent the views of, of those who are within their domain, whether that's a constituency or a larger, or a larger region. Uh, I mean, we, we touched on this earlier. There, wa there was and um, there is indeed ongoing an argument about the relative levels of legitimacy. Mm. And uh, the idea is that uh, the idea has been put forward that constituency MPs are, or AMs rather are somehow more legitimate. You know, they've got a, their mandate is somehow stronger. And it's not surprising that that idea has taken root in the context of a UK political system which has been dominated by this idea of territorial mm. constituency representation. There's a kind of path dependency over what we think is natural uh, and right. But of course, it then had a very distinctive party political edge in the Welsh context, where one mm. party was dominating the constituency mm. section, other parties, as a consequence in a sense, were dominating in the list sections. Mm. And as, as Ilsa pointed out, there was lots of evidence of people from the list camping out in particular constituencies, much to the chagrin and annoyance of, of the sitting constituency AMs. And you know, that's, that is going to be an ongoing tension in the Welsh context while we still have this electoral system which is not particularly proportional and which does lead to the preponderance of one party in one section but not in another. I think it's just the inevitable consequence of the electoral system and, if you like, the electoral history of the UK. Mm -hmm.
I mean, I think one solution um, is to move from closed list PR for the regionalists, which mm. we have at the moment, you, you vote for the party, to some form of open list PR where you either vote for the party and then have the option of saying, and it's this particular person off this regional list that I want, or you're actually forced to pick a candidate on the regional list. So some sort of move to open list PR. But I think one thing that's made that slightly unattractive is that it takes from parties the control they have over the, over the closed lists. And so in terms of ensuring that people from particular underrepresented groups are on that list, that control is gone. But it also introduces some of the problems of, of other electoral systems where you're competing not just as a candidate against other parties, but you're competing against candidates from your own party. And that can open up other cans of worms that just are not there at the moment. Hmm. Well, um, on that note, we have to leave it. That is a fascinating uh, first seminar. Thank you very much for your questions, um, both on the discussion boards and on Twitter. My thanks to Judith, to Ilsa and to Richard. And I hope you can join us again at the same time next week. Um, we'll be answering more of your questions about the Scottish and Welsh elections. Until then, goodbye.